Thanks, Kenny. Uh, honored to be here as always. I, uh, I did a radio interview in Greenville, North Carolina uh, uh, the week before we played East Carolina, and we had just defeated North Texas at homecoming uh, to go forward to at the time. And the uh, gentleman who was interviewing me said, you know, it's, things are pretty good down there in South Louisiana. I said, well, you know, at that time the Saints were still undefeated. That was the week before the, the Patriots game. And basically I said, look, you're in South Louisiana in the fall and the Saints are winning. There's not many better places to live in the, in the fall while, when the Saints are winning. Now you throw on top of that, obviously LSU was having uh, at that time a good year. They, they had only lost to Georgia at the time. And Tulane was 4-2. and two. So when you throw on top that the local college teams are doing well, right now we're in we're pretty much in football nirvana, um, and it's fun to be a part of. Uh, obviously, another big win on uh, on Saturday against Tulsa. Again, this is a team who Tulane had had all kind of trouble uh, playing. Average margin of uh, victory for Tulsa in the eight games when we played them before was 42 to 13. Uh, so for Tulane to actually a beat Tulsa, b hold them to seven points uh, is nothing short of miraculous. We back, we actually had two leads on Tulsa in eight years, and both of those leads were three to nothing. So again, what happened on Saturday, you, you can put that in perspective. Um, the formula for the Green Wave this year has been pretty simple, actually. Uh, play outstanding defense, keep your team in the ball game, outstanding special teams, other than one game, the Syracuse game, and do enough offensively to win. And that has been the that's been the formula, and that is why Tulane is six and two right time at this time. And again, the exact same formula took place on Saturday. Outstanding defense holding Tulsa to seven, forcing more turnovers. Tulane again second in the country in turnovers forced, three more interceptions and a fumble uh, forced. And uh, again, when you have to do it offensively, they've been able to get it done. Uh, being with Nick Montana at quarterback. Or in the last two weeks, we've seen Devin Powell, who has just made leaps uh, and strides way where uh, where he was, in, even in fall camp. And obviously, all the credit has to go to Curtis Johnson and his staff. They have been absolutely fantastic. The kids have bought in. You know, one of my uh, color analysts, Jimmy Orno, and Steve Barrios is here as well today. But uh, we do a post game show after uh, after our home games. And the thing about it is, is the coaching staff can have a message, but at some point you have to start winning games for that message to really take hold. And Curtis Johnson had a message last year, but obviously so many things happen on and off the field that no coach, much less a first year coach, who had never had a head coaching job before, uh, he, he just didn't deserve what, what he got last year. But you, you could see in fall camp that the attitude was different. Now again, that can only go so far. Sooner or later, you're gonna have to win some football games. Well now, the thing that it's made it so much fun for anyone associated with the program is you see a complete buy-in on both sides. The players have bought into the coaches. The coaches trust the players enough uh, to execute the game plan. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And um, you know, you go back to Saturday and just forcing the turnovers and again seeing Devin Powell, you're down seven nothing and Tulsa had control of the ball game and Tulane got a break with a missed field goal, but you know good teams get breaks. And we've been able to capitalize on our breaks this year. And Powell drives him down the field right before halftime to tie the game up. I thought that was huge, huge momentum shift. And then uh, getting a beneficial call on a, on a reversal on a fourth down play. Which Tulane went for it in field goal range, maybe slightly outside of Cairo Santos's range. Took a gamble, went for it, got uh, the, the spot was behind the sticks. They challenged the call. It was reversed. Two plays later, Devin Powell and Ryan Grant, and Tulane had a 14-7 lead that they would not relinquish. So, you know, I mentioned uh, the offense and the, the opportunistic offense, the opportunistic defense, and the best kicker in the country, Cairo Santos who's won two games this year. We haven't had a game-winning kick since 2003, and Santos beat North Texas and East Carolina in, in consecutive games. So, again, uh, kudos to the coaches, uh, the assistants, uh, Lionel Washington and, and John Sumrall. What they have done with this defense has been 
Again, nothing short of miraculous when you consider where our defense has been uh, in the last 10 years. To, to only give up 23 points a game at Tulane is, is pretty special. Um, they have done a great job. Mike New's done a great job with our quarterbacks. And uh, Keith Williams has done a great job with the wide receivers. It's a team effort, and that's basically uh, how it's been this year. And that, again, why Tulane is bowl eligible. Now, again, they're not assured of a bowl, but six wins get you at least in the mix. And I think the, the most impressive thing is when you listen to these kids, uh, after the game's over, they're not done. They, they're just like, you know, we, we've got six games. We, we're going, no, 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 no. The, the goals are still out there now. A conference championship is a reality. And they are not satisfied. And if you hear these kids talk, they're not satisfied. And I think that's the most refreshing thing is they believe there's more work to be done, and, and there is. So um, hopefully it's going to be a very special November because October was pretty darn good. Two went undefeated in the month. So if you have any questions, have at it. Injuries, Ken, uh, especially Davenport, and how's uh, Montana? Well, I think, Chris, if um, – if we would have played extra in that game, if we would have, if Tulsa would have scored and we would have had to go into overtime, not quite sure about Davenport. He looked a little gimpy coming off. I believe it was his ankle. Um, it looked it looked a little worse than than I think it is right now. Again, we'll see tomorrow when they go back to practice and and I'm able to watch practice and, and see. But obviously, Chris Davenport has been a huge part of this defense. Uh, you know, he went down three pay three plays before the final play. So uh, not having him in the last two uh, plays of that last drive was, it was, you know, kind of a setback for us, but that makes it even more impressive that we were able to get the big sack with Royce LaFrance. And then, of course, on a fourth and 25, it was a, it was a Hail Mary situation. And um, it, was, uh, it was nowhere near. By the way, I did get a message that uh, Sam Schofield, who had a career-high 18 tackles, uh, in that game against Tulsa, was named the Conference USA Defensive Player of the Week. So that is four straight weeks that Tulane has played without the bye week, that Tulane has had the Defensive Player of the Week in the conference. Now think about that. Um, again, going back to what we've had defensively the last few years, it's just, it's phenomenal. And, and it's been a different player every week. So it's, uh, it's good stuff. Oh, Nick, um, we'll see again tomorrow. I, I had a pretty good feeling he wasn't going to do. Uh, he, now, he practiced more than he didn't practice at all uh, in the bye week. Uh, he, he was on a pitch count, so to speak. He was only able to throw about 40 balls during, during the week. But you could tell as the week went on that he wasn't going to play in that Tulsa game. Now, uh, Coach Johnson said after the game he expects him to play this week uh, against Florida Atlantic. Again, we'll see. When, uh, when practice goes, gets back underway tomorrow, how he is, but he, he's going to be in much better shape than he's been in the last two weeks. And that's another, that's a tough, tough kid right there. Uh, that North Texas game, final drive, he played with a separated shoulder, a throwing shoulder, and was able to drive down the field for the win. So, some toughness right there. Yeah. Todd, concerning the uh, new stadium, it looks like it's going to be a great deal. Yep. Will Tulane play some SEC schools or, or maybe Texas or Florida State if they get them on the schedule at the Dome and play one or two games at the Dome every year, as, as was talked about, and also uh, about the high school usage of Tulane Stadium. Understand they can use they can play one high school game a week during the football season. How is that going to be divvied up, or is it going to be divvied up? Again, uh, you probably know as much as I do. Again, as far as I know, uh, I believe there's going to be a high school games played at the new stadium. Um, where, when, you know, what time of day? That's you know, that's uh, that's for the people who are in a much higher pay grade than I am. So, uh, but uh, to my knowledge, they will play high school games there. As far as the stadium itself, um, you know, and. and bigger schools like that, that's why the Dome is an option, just in case you, if you play one of those teams that are going to bring a ton of fans. We'll see about that. But I know ideally they'd like to play those games on campus. And if you are driving around uptown, the uptown area, go drive down Ben Weiner Drive. Um, 
go past the baseball stadium and you can really see how this thing is going up and I'm there every day and something new happens every day. The, the thing about it is that I don't think that can be gauged is now when these kids go into the Wilson Center and put on their practice uniforms to go wherever they are, uh, Tuesday it's out at the Saints facility, Wednesday it's at the Superdome, and Thursday at the outfield at Turchin Stadium actually, Griffin and Turchin Stadium. But they go in their locker room and they can go out on the 60 yard field where they're doing drills and literally look and see steel and concrete coming up. It is a tangible thing now to these kids. And now Curtis Johnson can recruit with this tangible thing coming out of the ground uh, right there on Ben Water Drive. It, it, to say that it's an exciting time is an understatement. Uh, just with all that's happening this year and now with the stadium online and, and we'll, we'll be in it next year. It's, uh, again, it's, it's pretty heady stuff right now. Real quick, hearing you talk of uh, moving 230 to night games, that again, uh, that's that's again above my pay grade. I, I would imagine that now there there are lights. I mean, you can see the lights on Clayboard, so uh, we'll we'll be able to play night games. I would imagine uh, early on in the year uh, that would be uh, that would be advantageous to all involved. But again, we'll see what happens. Uh, I know uh, the coaches like to play in, in, at two thirty. So, uh, but again, that's been in the Superdome. We'll, we'll see what happens uh, when we go outside. Will the new stadium be expandable? To my knowledge, it will be. So, yes. Now, look, they, you, the thing about it is this. They built the Hurt Center where the, where the basketball team practices with the knowledge that, that one day that there would be a football stadium there where it's intertwined. So they had the foresight that there would be a stadium there eventually, and you got to believe they're building this thing with, uh, with expansion in mind. It, Again, considering the way it's going right now, if the program continues to get better, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough ticket, which is exactly what you want. Todd, on a wider note, is it true the rumors about uh, possibility of Brian Hughes rejoining you as play-by-play -play for two-way baseball? He is he is more than welcome anytime he wants to take the mic. Now, again, he was my very first color analyst for baseball, and his family's here, so this is kind of a uh, it, it funny, but. The, the, the headset is always open for Brian. The thing about Brian is he actually, he decided to, to become a, a grown-up and get married and have children. That's why he had to stop doing the, uh, the games on the radio. Anything else? Thank you so much.